everyone and welcome back to our slash fat logic um couple of things i want to note uh one very curious to know how you like the intro there will also be an outro on this video uh, there might be one or two videos still uploaded without these because i do my like extra videos the those bonus videos that i do on like monday um i record kind of in bulk based on when I have the free time and then the fat logic videos are done weekly. Uh, so I'm very curious to know how you like that. Uh, and what you're seeing here is my dog Lily. I just thought it might be nice to show you guys a different picture before we actually got into it. So just curious to know how you like the changes and thank you all that have subscribed. At the time of this recording, I'm up to almost 50 subscribers, and I'm really excited, so thank you. And uh, let's just jump into it. It's statistically more dangerous to be underweight than overweight, signaling that the obesity epidemic is far more about rampant anti-fat bias than it is about health. So, um, okay, let's, let's pretend for... A moment even though this statistic uh, isn't cited at all let's let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that underweight is more dangerous than overweight let's just let's just hand that to them for a moment okay even if that were the case this still doesn't help typical fat logicians arguments because most of them are far outside of the overweight category if they actually found this in a study the study was using underweight and overweight criteria based on the BMI. Now, I am bordering on obese myself uh, via the BMI, and I am under 200 pounds. A lot of these fat logicians are significantly over 200 pounds, often 300 to 400 pounds. So that overweight label doesn't really apply to them. That overweight label doesn't even apply to me. So, let's pretend that it's statistically more dangerous to be underweight than overweight. Okay, well, what's statistically more dangerous, being a little underweight or being obese? Because that's a different qualifier. But, of course, we can't check this because this statistic isn't actually cited as usual. What was the definition of underweight? Now, if we're doing it based on the BMI, that's great, but what if that line... I would think there might also be like one additional line for like severely underweight people. So if it's just based on those two categories, then okay, let's pretend that underweight is definitely more dangerous. But how far those are still kind of broad categories. So like let's say you're the at the top of the overweight BMI and uh the top of the underweight BMI, meaning that you are almost average weight. What's the more dangerous one there? I'm just, there's so much missing, and I love that they take this nothing claim that isn't, there's no evidence cited, and then tie that to anti-fat bias. No, honey, there's, it's like signaling that the obesity epidemic is far more about ra rampant anti-fat bias. No. The obesity epidemic is because I think it's like 60% of Americans are either overweight or obese. I, actually, I think it's more than that. I think it's... No, I need to, I need to look. So, 42.4% of the U.S. is obese. Now, that's not even overweight. That is obese. Nearly half of all Americans are obese. That is what we mean by the obesity epidemic. It is a signal of poor health. It puts you at so many more risks for health complications. And nearly half of America is obese. This is what the obesity epidemic is. This is why it's considered an epidemic. And it is not just anti-fat bias, honey. Anti-fat bias isn't even really a thing. So, moving on. I am fat. That's a physical health issue I have to address. You're skinny. 
That's an emotional health issue you have to address. So, there's a few things to unpack here. One, I find it interesting that they are acknowledging that fat is a physical health issue, which goes against a lot of the fat logician arguments that I've seen before. But I'm curious how skinny is supposed to be an emotional health issue. Like, not all skinny people are obsessed with being skinny. Like, even, I'm, I'm working really hard to become thinner. I would love to be skinny, but I'm not obsessed over it. So how exactly, it does nothing for me emotionally. Like, how is it an emotional health issue? I'm, I'm very curious about that. But I do like that they acknowledge that being fat is a physical health issue. Funny thing is, is that fat is also likely an emotional health issue due to the abundance of binge eating issues, um, disordered eating, however you want to frame that. I think that there's a lot of, I think there's more binge eating issues in the U.S. than is talked about, um, but even ones that don't broach the, like, binge eating portion, there's a lot of overeating and emotional eating and eating as a, as a way to soothe yourself. Eating as a way to celebrate. Eating is tied heavily to emotions, at the very least in the U.S. I can't speak for other countries. So fat, to a degree, is also largely an emotional issue that people need to get control over. Something that I learned now that I've been more strictly adhering to healthy eating and stuff is my... Emotional eating is largely tied to three things. Either I'm very sad, very angry, or I'm close to my period and feel a little out of control because of issues I have surrounding my period. Um, all of those, for me, I would fall, file under emotional issues that contribute to weight gain. So, being fat is both a physical health issue and an emotional health issue, and I'm not sure where you're getting skinny is an emotional health issue. I wish this were expanded on. My toxic trait is that I think bullying anorexic fat phobes is always funny and justified. Lol. Thing is, you are a shitty person. And, I mean, it's like that's my toxic trait, and clearly she doesn't really view it as toxic because she... This person finds it funny. I'm assuming it's a she. If the person you are bullying is genuinely anorexic, they have already enough going on mentally that they don't need your bullying to compound their issue. A lot of people that are anorexic aren't anorexic because they are scared to be fat. Anorexia and starvation is a form of control. You bullying them about not eating more and trying to like guilt them or bully them into eating more is likely only to exacerbate the issue of anorexia because from what I've seen and heard from people who have struggled with anorexia, anorexia is almost always more of an issue about control than it is about actually controlling your weight. It's just that they want to be able to control what they put in their body because they feel out of control for one reason or another due to abuse that they've suffered, or a any number of things. So you bullying them makes you a piece of shit. Every morning I used to get on the scale. Whether I was up or down, it didn't matter. The number always told me I wasn't good enough. While in the program, I took the advice to change my scale, putting affirmations where the numbers once were. Now the scale tells me I'm perfect, sexy, and looking good. And seeing that actually helps me eat better. So, question about this, though. Like, if you don't want to monitor your weight, fine, I guess you do you. What, Whatever, that's, that's your thing. Then, you know, focus on measuring your, like, actual body measurements. Working out, and that's ways to see, notice how your clothes fit. Are they getting looser? That sort of thing. Those are perfectly valid forms of progress. I'm curious to know what they mean by eating better, though, because if it's one thing that I've learned while tracking calories, it's that 
you can think that you're doing better, but you're either doing the same or you're actually consuming slightly more calories than you realize, sometimes even significantly so, something that we think is not that big of a deal. Oh, it's just the one time or something. You don't realize how much, how many calories are there. Like there's this, I don't know if anyone eats Tony, Tony's chocolate only chocolate bars. They are the fucking bomb. It's Belgian chocolate. They're salted, uh, caramel chocolate bar is fucking amazing and um, it's like the caramel is treated in a different way that's almost like a toffee it's fantastic I ate one once and then didn't do the math until way later that one chocolate bar has a thousand calories in it it's like you think oh I had a chocolate bar it's not that big of a deal and it was really good it was a thousand calories so like I don't I don't really eat those anymore unless I um, either got a shit ton of steps. Like one day I was at like 18,000 steps. I had 1,500 calories left still in my food bank and I was just going to eat a modest dinner so I could have that chocolate bar. But had I not had those significantly extra steps and I had not eaten very sensibly throughout the day, eating that would have destroyed any weight loss progress for the week. It's, you can't say something helps you eat better without actual measurable results. It may have made you feel better and it may have made you feel like you have more control over what you eat. And that's fine. That's totally valid. But that's not the same as actually doing better in your weight loss journey or your health journey. I'm sorry, but why is 250 pounds always assumed to be fat content? You do realize muscle is denser and takes up less space. 250 pounds can't be generalized with the image on the left. There is no standard image for any number. You would have to have a lot of muscle to make 250 pounds. Dwayne Johnson is literally 260 pounds, and he's one of the largest and most buff guys on the planet. Yes, I agree with this. Um, I had talked to a couple of friends one time when I realized I was like gaining weight and I wasn't happy about it, and they're like, oh, it's all muscle. It's clearly all muscle. No, it's not. I appreciate you trying to make me feel better, but it's not. It's fat. Like, Unless you are bodybuilding, most of the muscle that you have is not going to show up on the scale. If you did a lot of, if you have been doing a lot of working out and you reach a plateau week, that muscle gain um, and fat loss could have been like proportional enough to each other to result in that net zero progress. But in general, no, 250 pounds is not going to be enough, uh, or not enough, but 250 pounds is not going to be all muscle. Very rarely is it going to be all muscle, and you would be able to see it just on you if it was. I think the muscle thing is a form of denial. And it's just a way to be like, I'm not actually that fat. I'm not actually that fat because they can't face the reality and they can't own up to where their actions and their choices and their behaviors have gotten them. To lose weight, it used to be recommended that to lose a pound per week, you would need to decrease total calories by 500 a day. Now researchers, researchers believe weight loss is a slower process and that a decrease of 10 calories a day leads to the loss of about one pound in a year. The key is to be patient and work with a dietitian to help find the right plan for you. I call bullshit. Literally every single link when you look up the correct amount of um, weight to lose, a slow, slower um, progress per week would be one to two pounds. That's considered slow weight loss. Now, Sometimes trying to lose a pound a week is a bit overwhelming for people, and I think trying to lose half a pound a week is fine as well if you're really struggling that much. But losing a pound a year is just fucking bonkers. Like, the average person, even if you're in a perfect maintenance phase, 
is still going to vary by one to five pounds a week. Like you're probably going to stay within a five pound range, five to probably five to ten pound range. But like it's not an exact science to keep your body at a maintenance level. Your body is just naturally going to fluctuate for a variety of reasons. So to act like a pound a year is what you need in order to have true sustainable weight loss? No. No. It's, that's not how that works. That's, that's, maybe that's all this person could do. But I don't believe whoever wrote this, this is some bullshit. And I don't really care for the misinformation spreading in whatever the fuck this is. So, fuck off. And either admit that you don't actually want to lose weight, admit that you're not very good at losing weight, or, you know, just suck it up and do the work to actually lose a pound or two per week. I think what's important to remember about fat phobia is that its most damning consequences, the brutal abuse and death of fat people, serve to reinforce its structuring logics. That fat people are always and already dying, evidence of societal and personal decline. The work of undoing fat phobia thus is both pointing out the hypocrisy of the medical industry that has the audacity to call fat people an epidemic, while actively hastening their deaths, and about understanding the broader discourse of blame and unworthiness that allow institutions to commit murder while swearing the, that victims did it themselves. All right. <laughs> okay. So, I had to try, I had to take, do a couple of takes of this because I, I was losing it at the brutal abuse and death of fat people. No. No. Fat people die because they don't do the, it's, it's like smokers that don't want to quit smoking and then get cancer. Like, doctors are not going to put out huge amounts of medical resources that others that are genuinely trying can use to save your ass. When you refuse to do the bare minimum of quitting smoking, it's the same with weight loss. You have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and you are making zero efforts to change your diet and lose some weight. No, doctors aren't going to use the resources to help you because it would be a short-term help. It would be a short-term help and unless you are very young, maybe they would offer you some more help. Probably what they would do though is just offer you like a medical weight loss program because that is what is needed to treat a lot of your conditions. So if you are dying, yes, it is likely because the doctor told you repeatedly that you need to lose weight and you said, fuck you, you fat phobic asshole. Well, then what the fuck do you want? And the fact that they're like, they have the audacity to call fat people an epidemic. They're not saying you as a fat person are an epidemic. Obesity is a medical condition at this point. And that is the epidemic. And I'm sorry that you don't like that. And I'm sorry that you have don't like having your choices medicalized. But it is an issue. And it is tied to other weight loss issues. It just is. It Or not weight loss issues, but health issues. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, damaged joints, um, diabetes, certain cancers... Like, it's there because of your weight, and that's why you need to lose weight. And it's not that anyone is blaming you and calling you unworthy of life, but no one is going, like, everyone's doing everything they can to survive themselves. No one's going to do a disproportionate amount of work for someone that won't help themselves to lose weight. Lose, put some effort in. This isn't ableism. This isn't, you are not a protected class. You need to get that through your fucking head 
and realize that you need to lose some weight. I love that they call it committing murder. No one is committing murder. If, let's say you have high blood pressure that is putting you at risk of heart disease and heart attacks, and the doctor is like, we'll put you on some medication, but you really need to lose weight, you need to get more active, and you need to eat healthier. And the fat logician is like, fuck you, you fat phobic monster. The doctor's like, fine, fucking, here is some blood pressure meds, but what's really going to control it is your weight. They don't do anything. Their blood pressure continues to climb and they try to use the medication, but if there's difficulty, there's always this period of time when you're trying out a new medicine to check for um, side effects, to check and see what the dosage that you need is to get the optimum result. Well, while you're in that trial period, you have a heart attack and you die. That's not the fucking doctor's fault. That's not the fucking doctor's fault. You made no effort to improve your health. It is not the doctor's fault that you died. It is not the doctor's fault that you had a heart attack. It is your fault. It is your fault. Firstly, you are still stuck in the 1960s with your advice being based on calories of food. Do you understand what a calorie is? It is a measurement of heat, of physically burning a food or meal in a bomb calometer. And measuring just the heat given off that raises the temperature of one liter of water by one degree Celsius at sea level. As some pathetic representation of how food gets digested, absorbed, and metabolized in the body. The calories are a nonsense idea and unscientific and irrelevant to how healthy a food is. Food contains nutrients, not calories. Alright, Sharon. I, one, food contains both, both nutrients and calories. They are not mutually exclusive. You can have both. A lot of those nutrients are, in fact, forms of calories that are processed slightly differently in the body, but the overall energy expenditure for those items can be measured by the same measurement of calories. Your body is physically burning the food for fuel. Do you notice how we are warm-blooded mammals? That is because we burn energy, which is food, for our heat source that our body then processes to maintain a level of warmth, a, a temperature in the body. That is why people who tend to be a bit thinner tend to get cold a bit more easily while people that are fatter and have more heat because they are burning more fuel tend to be warmer. Fat people actually burn more calories just by sitting there and doing nothing than thin people do because their body is burning all of that excess fuel. Now, this is very much a layman's interpretation of how calories work. I am in no, by no means a biology major. I don't have any real background in this at all, and I want to be clear about that. But their method of determining how many calories are in any given item is not wrong. It's actually been fairly consistent, and it's a pretty good metric for determining how much fuel and how many how dense the energy that you're taking in is based off what your own body can burn. Now, even with this, you know, fairly reliable measurement, there's always like this margin of error and that's what I think a lot of people don't understand is that there's a margin of error for everything and it can seem really big. Um for instance, there was I bought a book for a class once that said it was 98% accurate reprint of this one public domain work. Because all they did was scan it, the computer would scan the text, retype it out into a Kindle-friendly format, or like something that could be printed directly. I think it was a KDP 
but it said it was 98% accurate. That means every 100 words, there would be two words that were misspelled or wrong or whatever. Now, 98%, you think, okay, that's cool. That's fine. That's totally cool. But it equaled to, like, five or six words being wrong per page. And that became very tedious when you're reading through it to continually notice this issue with either syntax, spelling, word choice, or whatever it is that they use with this computer algorithm. So even if something says that it has like a 2% margin of error, that can still be seem relatively big otherwise, but that doesn't mean that it's still not a reliable form of measurement. This just kind of reeks that you don't really understand how measurements and how margin of error and how science kind of works and you just think it sounds preposterous therefore it is and to me that is a bigger signal of your closed-minded nature and not lack of intelligence but lack of reasoning it seems like you're just looking for things to feel victimized about and discredit so that way you can be more secure with what you're doing so I'm gonna leave it there as for my own uh, weight loss journey I started my period the day that I weighed in and it said I gained a pound which I'm taking with a grain of salt and we will see next week if it is actually still there or if I lost that weight gain plus like an additional pound or two so we will see next week and I'm just gonna kind of leave it there for this week and I'm going to be recording another Marissa video today. You guys probably won't see it for a couple of weeks, but look forward to that. And I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.